you. So thanks. Thanks, Neil. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I came to this conference two years ago, and one of the things that sort of came out of this that trip, uh, more or less indirectly, was uh, a paper that ended up being sort of part of my thesis um, on a philosophy of science perspective on practicing a science of security. And one of the things we, we talk about a lot of things in that paper. It's a, like 17,000 words because there was a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about something pretty specific out of it, so it'll be a little bit shorter. Um, so you can pause the video and read that. Great. OK. Um, so I'm not going to do too many things. I am going to ask that you let me, that you hold your comments for five slides so I can introduce everything, unless you've got some sort of clarificatory question. So I'm going to keep the sort of history of the philosophy of science aspect of this quite brief, because I know that's not what all of you are most focused on, but I promise also it does matter a bit. Um, I'm going to reference back to the CFP for the conference, right, um, and talk about this area uh, in, I guess, academia called philosophy of science in practice, and suggest that that might be helpful, and then ask you some questions. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time summarizing the paper. Um, I will say that a lot of the motivation was that all of the talk in academia up until we published that paper was anyone who'd published on it said that s InfoSec was not a science. Some of them said it couldn't be. Some of them said it wasn't yet. But no one was willing to say that what you all do is currently science. And so we came out and we're like, yeah, it totally is. All of you can shush. That's really silly. Why are you making these arguments? Here's, here's the 19 pages of lit review for why these arguments don't make sense. Um, so the 20 word summary of those 19 pages is this. So in the 20s, physics was super confusing. All of the smart people thought about physics. The people who wanted to figure out what science was were also the same people in Vienna who were trying to figure out why fascism was happening. The Vienna Circle, right? So. There's a bit of a gap there, actually, where World War II happens and no one talks about this. And then in the 50s, everyone who, th who talked about it was like, OK, science is physics. And that means we need to figure out what the laws of nature are in physics. And everything that is science must look like physics, because that's the only thing that we know of is science. Remember that like historically, they'd only just figured out what DNA was. And like biology was consistently derided as stamp collecting. by like very serious academics were like, you're not scientists, you're stamp collectors. And Darwin was like, what the hell, guys? Like, this is, and the physicists were just like, nah, it's just garbage. So there's um, a bunch of work from the 60s to the 2000s, uh, which is what I want to, which is what I've leveraged in a lot of my work. Um, basically saying like, that's silly. Science is a super complicated social phenomenon about how we evidence things. And like, it's not just like laws of nature that are based on logic. Um, and apparently, all of the computer scientists who write about this uh, in a like science of security perspective just missed those 55 years of philosophy of science. And we're like, ah, there's no laws of nature in security, so it's not a science. Which makes it not physics, which I think we can all agree that it's not physics, but that's not super helpful. Um, so. You know, we can get into all of that background, but I'm going to try to actually more be the translator from that background to what your actual problems are, and not try to make you all learn all of it. Um, so, Gadi Sunil, good job. You didn't fall into this trap. <laughs> so, specifically, what I'm going to pull out of this is share the methodologies in a consistent and systematic way, um, because I think that that's something that other sciences can sort of offer some advice on. Um, and so we can talk about what that means. So I mean, here's my hypothesis, right? I think that what systematic and consistent is going to mean is like, OK, what does general knowledge actually look like? Which means, how do we know that we know something stable that's reliable when we see it, right? What should the features of a good chunk of general knowledge look like, OK? How do we collect reliable and robust evidence, which includes so that adversaries can't sneak stuff in there and trick us, but it also includes so that we don't trick ourselves. Right? It includes all the cognitive bias stuff that Kelly was talking about. Right? 
Um, and then how do we know when it's stable? Right? Like how long do we have to think about something being stable? And that's probably not a s one size fits all question, <laughs> right? To your sort of pets and cattle question, right? We need to know something stable about pets for a lot longer period of time than we need to know about cattle, right? Um, so I have long and involved answers for these things. Um, the general knowledge thing is also a sort of philosophy, science, academia, code word for causation analysis, right, or causal analysis. Um, but the Perl stuff that Kelly mentioned is a little bit divisive, and so I think that people try to avoid the word causal when they don't want to get into that fight, and so they'll just say explanation, which you can all read as meaning causal explanation. It doesn't super matter, but if you need to translate, you can go ahead. Um, I think that we don't want to be super narrow about experiments being the only way to gather reliable knowledge, right? I have a sort of pet complaint that like the attack papers at DEF CON are actually all case studies, and there's actually good norms for what a good case study should look like in sociology. And if we ported those over to the DEF CON papers and made appropriate adjustments for that it's a different domain, we could say what a good case study in that environment should look like, what it should have, how it's reliable, robust, transferable, right? I don't want to say repeatable because case studies aren't things that you repeat, but how you can understand how to generalize that knowledge to another situation, how you know when you can't, all of this stuff. Um, I think if you look, f I could, I'd blog post about that at some point at UCL, so you can find a little bit written up about that. Um, so it's not just experiments. I try to say structured observations because that includes case studies, natural experiments, these sorts of things. But lots of different stuff from science that we can port over. So like, why aren't we, right? That's not actually a rhetorical question. Like, what's the knowledge gap that's stopping us from borrowing those methodologies from other sciences? Um, I don't really have a good answer for the third one. We probably all have to agree. But any more? Or most of us have to agree, like rough consensus. So here's my one real like working hypothesis before I get into asking everyone's opinions. So uh, I hypothesize that basically good threat intel explanations look an awful lot like good scientific explanations. They have transparency in reasoning. They have transparency in evidence collection. You know, you have good information about where your evidence came from. You have good information about the vantage points that you have, what the biases in those vantage points are, how you've mitigated those, right? You have various kinds of background knowledge on what the base rates of occurrence of things are, so you know if something is actually rare or if it's just actually the way things are, all of these sorts of things. Um, no one really talks about this in academic circles, and because these are sort of a weird group of academics in the first place for science and technology studies or philosophy of science, they basically don't have anyone to translate into this threat intel world because the academics in the computer science departments don't seem to be super interested. And so there's a sort of translation gap between the people that might be able to provide some of this metaphors to other sciences and, and the people in the room. So I'm trying to see if that's a problem that actually s is exists or if I'm making that up. And if it does actually exist, then what we can do about it. Um, and so I think that this philosophy of science and practice thing might be useful, at least if you can sort of decode some of this. Um, right, so figure out the role that artifacts play in shaping practice. Artifacts being intrusion detection systems, malware AV, right? Um, so like, how does that AV system impact what sort of knowledge you can get out of it? They are obviously talking about different artifacts because they're talking about biology or medicine or whatever. Um, but also this sort of idea that it's not all physics, right? That we take a holistic view and a pluralistic view of the different disciplines that are relevant to science, this sort of thing. Um, 
and I think also, I mean, practice or practical has a lot of different meanings. But the idea here is not philosophizing for the sake of getting tenure. The idea is philosophizing for the sake of getting better results in the, in the domain, in security, right? So I think that there's some uh, maybe people there that are, or ideas there that are useful. But again, like there's going to be some translation effort. Um, and I think one of my sort of conceptions of this is that if I have done the work to sort of integrate myself into this, then I can be someone maybe that you guys know that you could talk to, to be like, okay, how does this translate? And then I won't know everything that you guys have a problem with. And then we can sort of iterate and then I can only explain it to so many people, but then it goes out and sort of propagates. I don't know. That's sort of a meta thing about your goal about how we transform the art into a science. I don't know the pedagogy aspect of this either, but that's like a different problem. Okay, so audience participation, step one. Um, someone capture these in the Slack maybe, because I don't have that. I'm not gonna write this down and I won't remember. I guess it'll be on video. Um, so what makes it hard for you to observe things in like a careful or structured way. Um, and we'll do some call outs and some write them in the Slack. I'd argue that adversarial intent is one of, is one of those things. Yeah. So certainly adversaries. And then while I walk back to this other person, I will comment that like psychiatry has this problem and so does economics and like game theory talks about this. So like, does that help or why doesn't it help or these sorts of things? I'd say the rate of change has a big uh, influence on how we can apply engineering and science ideas to what we do too, because things change so fast. It's hard to compare apples to apples over a five or 10 year span, let alone 50 or 100 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah so rate of change is super important. Um, I think I, I have one weird idea about that, which is that a lot of people wanna say that you can't automate experiments or something like this, but can we, right? So like if we can, then maybe it's okay. If the result only needs to be viable for 20 minutes, then we just need to know that, right? Uh, I'll give you another uh, approach to the problem of treating infosecure science. Uh, look at it as, uh, as an astronomy, not as physics, but astronomy, which is observing things that might have happened only once and building models to, to explain them. And uh, in FOSEC, uh, I think the basic problem is that lots of, lots of people uh, come from uh, not scientific backgrounds, so they don't have the discipline to, to try to do that. So I think uh, there's a lot of scientific disciplines that only can observe things once or can't actually do experiments, right? So we don't crash stars together to figure out how supernova work. We don't have the power to do that experiment. Um, paleontology also doesn't do experiments or archeology, span right? But that also doesn't mean they don't interface with parts of science that do, right? Because one of the things that does inform uh, you know, our idea of how astronomy works has to do with when we do fusion reactions or fission reactions in nuclear reactors, right? We understand that we're dealing with something that's transferable under certain circumstances or radiography to figure out what chemical spectra are there, right? Um, paleontology, similarly, you know, you talk about carbon dating or uranium dating or whatever, right? And so I'm interested in the way that these things interact. And so I think in, in security, some of these things are forensic, right? And you can observe them only once and you're trying to put something back together. But also we have access to knit that together with experiments that we can do. You know, we can do studies on how people react to phishing emails. And if we're careful about it, we can probably know something about how people reacted to phishing emails in the past. We have to be careful because we can't assume that my 27 undergraduate psychology majors are gonna respond the same way as your IT staff, because they probably won't. But we could do better ones, all here and in here. 
the biggest issue for me would be the availability of information and correlating valid information. I've had a lot of investigations where we assume one thing based on the evidence we have and through all intel channels we have and then informally I talk to a friend in law enforcement and suddenly dots get connected and my entire perspective will shift. I think um, information and the fact that we build the system is actually a new problem, right? Like if you wanna study how one of the IT providers or whatever builds their software, but then you know, the adversaries are trying to break your software and then you fix it. So you're doing some science to figure out what the adversaries are doing and they're doing some science to figure out what you're doing and they both are reasonably secret. I don't think that there's a good parallel to that and I think we've got to figure that one out actually. So, and then um, so I'll try to, I have a big problem uh, with measurement, the way we measure things. Um, there's a lot of, I think, a lot of different people with a lot of different interests to measure things in, uh, in specific ways that complement certain ways of doing things which aren't um, objectively good. Uh, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a major problem. One example is like measuring the difference between two AV softwares by the number of... Uh, of malwares they catch, which doesn't mean anything. So I wanna maybe spin that measurement thing back to the general knowledge thing, right? So one particular item isn't general knowledge. You gotta know like how the whole system works, but I think that we gotta specify some of that stuff out and that's a good point. Right, so along those lines, I think there is a, a dearth of data science capabilities within a, and talent and skill sets within the InfoSec teams. A lot of times you see folks that think that discipline is uh, common knowledge or common sense, but then you run into problems that have already been highlighted where there's you know, a s distinct difference between causation correlation and survey bias and data bias that goes into, um, even when you're going to try to do a study, then you come out with really wrong conclusions because the f you don't have the, the craft of, of skill set data science um, and objectivity to design experiments and design, design these types of things within the teams. And so, you know, you, you gotta bring that skill set just like any other complementary skill set within to an organization to study your organization. That may not come up through someone who's never had any background in numbers or stats or any type of data modeling, right? It doesn't just poof come in. So you have to round out your teams in order to build that capability. Thanks, and then I think that one's partly like a human resources issue because we some uh, some sciences know how to do that, and partly I think that we probably have new experiment design problems. And there's also some things like the like sort of publication bias in psychology, where there's weird bias statistics statistics and what gets published or what gets talked about. Um, and so there's maybe some things we can learn from other sciences where they haven't figured it out either. So, so to that point, I think one of the problems relating InfoSec to science is everybody's too busy doing the InfoSec to do the science. And there's a ma I think the shortage of resources isn't necessarily within InfoSec, it's within the places that should be doing the studying. So there is zero government statistics that, that are usable on the size of the cybercrime problem, for example, and that, that follow a, a, a decent methodology over time. So we get the FBI can tell you how many cars were stolen every year for the last 50 years. Nothing like that exists in our government statistics right now. And, and so the resources, you know, I tried to study um, CISOs, what CISOs think, and it's very, very hard to get CISOs to talk to you because they're too busy doing CISOs. One thing I will say before we go into here and then I'll move on. Um, one of the things that came out of some of the philosophy of medicine stuff is that they get very good at doing randomized control trials, very good at doing randomized experiments, right? But if you don't have a good understanding, mechanistic understanding, some general knowledge, you don't know which experiments to do because you don't know what things you don't have some good understanding on and so I think we might be at the phase, not where we should say,
go do this experiment, right? But figure out qualitatively what the elements in the ecosystem are so we know what we should measure. Another problem is uh, you need to be Google or Microsoft uh, out, uh, Hotmail to observe uh, like uh, spam campaign dyna dynamics. You need to be a huge service provider. So <coughs> either for running uh, experiments to verify if you need to be Google or you need to do things that are uh, illegal like replica replicating the attack. And the third thing is uh, I tried to do some science on the InfoSec once and tried to research uh, actual numbers of uh, child pornography uh, uh, incidents. And uh, there are data that only are relative, relative to some unknown number. I talked to a company that filters uh, networks for this type, type of content. They say it's like in the last five years there is tenfold increase. But how much? Tenfold from from what? And they refuse to answer. Thanks. So I uh, don't know what to do about Google and Amazon owning everything. Um, but I think that if we really grab onto that, like, can we? describe an experiment that we really need to know the answer to well enough that they could go do it and tell us the answer and have it not reveal something sensitive, right? Like, is, is there something you really want to know that we can do that for? Because if not, right, then it's sort of a straw man. And if there is, then why don't we do that, right? Okay. So I really only have one more slide and then some more audience participation. So the, the metaphor from history of science and really history of physics right, draws on an anthropology metaphor. When you had um, people from disparate cultures that didn't speak the same language and didn't live in the same place but wanted to trade stuff, silk or corn or whatever, right, trading zones would appear. And those trading zones would have physical infrastructure, trading booths, roads, right? But they also have sociological and anthropological infrastructure. Pidgin and Creole languages, and the languages develop more complexity as they get more need for it, and the trading zones get richer. Right, so at first, you know, the people from different cultures just share a, tr a, a word for corn and silk, because those are the two things they trade, and maybe some numbers in the sand or whatever, and then eventually some of these Creoles became whole own languages, right? So Peter Gallison observes this happens in physics. The people who design the Large Hadron Collider and the people who do theoretical physics have basically nothing in common. One of them does, like, runs electricity through big supercooled wires, and the other one does math in their office. Someone needs to translate between these two people and figure out what the profitable ideas are to go between them and then go back to those respective communities and bring the item of value. How to design the wire, what theory you're looking to demonstrate or provide evidence for, right? So the hypothesis is basically that this is, although this is about physics, that this is really how all of science works. It's not like there's one God-given law of nature that then everything reduces to. There's a bunch of interwoven, overlapping trading zones between chemistry and biology, and organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, particle physics, and theoretical physics, you know, physical chemistry and particle physics, right? Where people come together at special conferences, special zones, special journals, share knowledge, and that gets translated back out. I think that the same thing is true in InfoSec. Right, like the people who understand how the passive DNS collection system works and the people who understand how spam emails get sent are actually different communities of people and they have a shared place where some of them come together, translate for each other, go back to their respective communities, make changes, right? We can go on with this. I think that the question that I wanna pose is, how do we make good trading zone infrastructure so that we can better share knowledge between these things. I see that as part of what this conference is trying to do. But we sort of don't know 
what everyone's expertises are because we don't have defined disciplines. Or because we all have to be sort of doing everything because sort of like you were saying, we're all overworked. You know, there's not enough people to do the jobs. The jobs aren't super well defined. So like maybe we need to, I don't want to over specify a problem. But if we don't all have well-defined job roles, how do we do better trading zones so that we can figure that out, right? That sort of a thing. Um, to that end, my last real question is, um, if there are features that make it hard, right, structured observation hard, then which of these features are shared with relatively few fields, and which of them are shared widely? And to some extent, I mean field here as um, even sub-disciplines within InfoSec, right? Like how many parts of network forensics have the same problems as vulnerability analysis or malware analysis or economic analysis or risk, uh, risk mitigation communication or whatever, right? Um, does anyone, I have what, four minutes or something? Sure. Um, who was here uh, the first year? Do you remember when Steve Crocker got a Skype call and he described this conference as a what? Do you remember? He said, I'm in a network security conference. That's what he said. I'm in a network security conference. I'll emphasize the word network. You're using the word info, which can talk to data security. And if you know, if you, for those who are familiar with my 5x5, five five, the cyber defense matrix, there's endpoint security, there's application security, there's user-centric security. What are the features of cyber security that make it hard for all of us? And it's that it requires all those disciplines for us to understand it completely. Steve Crocker certainly knows network security, but does he know, I don't know, I mean, does he know application security? I, I would hope so. But uh, understanding, having somebody who understands all those different, dis different disciplines all at once is the hard part. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. You had, did you have your hand up in the back that you wanted to? Okay. I think. Feature that's shared widely that we can probably use is, uh, we've heard it mentioned here a couple of times informally, is, is uh, incentives, right? Understanding economic incentives at individual levels, at organizational levels, uh, and, and beyond. One last note. I hope everyone has written all of this down in the Slack so that I don't have to remember this. So I, I would just give a shout out to criminology, right? Because one of the things that, that, that strikes me about InfoSec is we're, we're a lot of it's to do with bad actors and who are not cooperating. So in medicine, you're trying to solve problems with the cooperation, typically with the people who you're trying to help. Um, so yeah, the, they have addressed some of these things. If you're not familiar with the work of Alice Hutchins at Cambridge, I would suggest her work. So how much of this do you think is just a natural progression of this being a relatively new field and the fact that businesses and, and organizations need someone mature to come in on day one and the measure of a maturity of an organization really is gonna, y you can tell by if they're hiring new entries or something like that. So do you think maybe as time goes on um, and you know, some of us that are more seasoned, we get even more seasoned and then we have more people in that it will naturally evolve into something that is more like a field like medicine where there's specialties and stuff like that. So I have a, a good and a bad take on that. My uh, volleyball coach in high school didn't said perfect or practice doesn't make perfect. If you practice something like shit, you're going to do it like shit when you get better at it. Um, perfect practice makes perfect. So I would be a little bit hesitant to assume that it will just get better as we get older. Because I think that when you get older, you just get older and nothing else comes for free. On the other hand, yes, we'll accrue experience and it, we should be able to do it. But I think it's worth putting a little bit of thought, even if it's only a couple of us, into how to make sure that we share those insights and the like sort of teachability and the pedagogy isn't totally ad hoc because I think that it'll speed it up. And one thing, and I guess maybe this is my last point, is there is something weird about how fast InfoSec and cybersecurity, whatever, has been growing. And that 
it's not super obvious to me that it will follow the same path as something like medicine, which has a longer history and could grow slower, and is like relative to the lifetime of a human being happens slower. And so like, uh, we might want to be a little bit careful. But I think, yes, it will get better. OK. Am I suggesting it's a bubble? No, I'm suggesting that the rate of change based on technology is different in this era than it was 70 years ago. It, which is not independent from your question, but, but also might be a little bit different. OK, so I think that that's all my time. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, reach out if you feel free. Thanks, Jerno. <coughs> I'm sorry it's so cold, but hopefully it keeps you awake. All right, next up we have Michael Jenks. We're stealing him from the ops track um, because his talk is, because he actually prefers to talk about it here. So hey, there you go. Uh, <coughs> and his talk is operationalizing the attack matrix, right? All right, how we did it. Who's we in this case? Who's we? All right. Battery change. Oh, good. On your computer? Yep. We good? Awesome. Well, hey, let me start off. Uh, who in here loves red teams? Whoa, 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 whoa. That, that was a test, man. This is a defense conference. No red team loving allowed, man. All right. Well, hey, my name is Michael Jenks. I'm a managing partner at Adapt Forward uh, Cybersecurity. And really, with the explosion of MITRE attack over the last five or so years, I really wanted to share our story and how we were able to really help our customers implement it uh, and operationalize it in their environments. So again, Michael Jenks, Adapt Forward, we, uh, we're a defense contracting company. Um, you probably noticed the, the, the DOD stuff on the computer there, but also we've uh, recently transitioned into the, the commercial space. Uh, if you find this useful, uh, please give me a follow on Twitter. So I wanted to frame uh, the presentation, uh, give it a little background story. So uh, back up to 2012, 2013, we just came into a new customer environment. And to do what they do, uh, they have to be certified by a NSA certified red team. Um, that usually is not a, a pleasant experience. Um, so. Anyway, uh, the customer was assessed, and Red Team got initial compromise, initial foothold. Uh, no detection was made, right? Uh, got a little louder, still no detection. Uh, seemingly screaming from the rooftops, I am here, right? Uh, still no detection made. Finally, uh, Red Team says, hey, man, I quit. Uh, here's the white flag. Here's your report. You need to fix this stuff. So, okay, uh, we're, we're just coming into the environment, right? They're like, hey, whoa, what, what happened? Uh, we need to fix this. And, you know, upon looking on the report uh, that the, was provided to our customer, you kind of see that, hey, uh, man, a lot of the stuff that was being leveraged was not inherently malicious, right? Um, and really, you know, we're dealing with some of the, the, the best of the best, right, to where, man, defense and tech, uh, defense in depth architecture, uh, full vulnerability management program, uh, full of the whiz bang security appliances, you know, all the systems hardened, 
right? So why was Red Team successful? And uh, our customer asked us that same question. So that is where we came onto the scene. And we started off by asking them, okay, uh, I hear you. So can you tell me with 100% certainty what your enclave, what your network is protected against? Is that a question, sir? It's an answer. All right. Perfect. Man, uh, you, got, you got any questions right there? Um, so we followed that up with a, a, a secondary question. Who can tell me with 100% certainty what your organization is not protected against, right? Um, again, that was uh, a lot of crickets from the customer at the time. So, well, they said, hey, well, I have all of these whiz-bang appliances, right? And they say they protect me against everything. And, you know, sure enough, industry, man, I love them. And we need them. But uh, what do they say? Uh, well, let's say, uh, silence. 99% of threats presented, 100% peace of mind, amen. I want some of that in my life, right? Uh, FireEye, 99% detection rating. I hear you, I hear you. And uh, McAfee, 2020, come on, who's voting? Um, <laughs> amen. Uh, right, 99% 99 uh, detection rating, right? Um, does anybody believe this? Uh, I, I mean, I got my letter from OPM. Right, I got my. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Marriott member, right? <laughs> so, so, man. Okay, yeah. So obviously this isn't true. Nobody believes that, but that's what's you know that's marketing jargon, and they need to sell their products. And I, I tell you what, I'm not throwing any salt because what these what these products and what these vendors do at scale is amazing, right? Um, but they simply aren't great at detecting the real bad guys. So. Let's say it was true for a moment, right? Let's say, oh man, uh, I, I had uh, you know, this, this alert fire in my sim and, uh, and the, the appliance was like flashy, blinky lights and you know, thank God, uh, McAfee, you knocked that down and saved us, right? Oh man, thank you so much. Um, could you tell me why your product knocked that down, right? Could you, could you reveal why you know, the decision was made to block that? Well, of course, these vendors are going to say, well, I can't tell you that because that's my secret sauce, right? That is my proprietary competitive advantage against all my, my competitors that that's why you buy my product. So, you know, here you are um, at the end of the day, you're a incident responder, you're in InfoSec, right? Your, your responsibility is to defend these networks, but yet at the end of the day, you don't really know what you're protected against and what you're not. You don't understand your true risk posture, right? So that's a scary place to be. So um, after we familiarized our, our customer uh, with this, this concept, we said, hey, um, man, we're, we're really love to help you. So here's how we look at threats. Um, we bucketize them into two main categories, the 95% and the 5%. So we look at 95% of the stuff that's out there is just run-of-the-mill run garbage malware, right? Um, we honestly don't care about it much. We transfer that risk to industry. That's our insurance policy against that, right? Which leaves our teams to concentrate on the 5%, the real bad guys, the human on keyboard, nation state actors. Right? So again, there's a, there's a billion ways to compromise a network, seemingly, right? O days to vulnerabilities to who knows what. It seems like the adversaries can always get in, but after they get in, after they get that initial foothold, there's only a few finite things that they can do to be successful in their mission, and that's what you concentrate on. So, whoop. Not Barney. So what must they do? So back in 2013, we were helping our, our customer develop a solution to detect, you know, bad that's not necessarily bad, but it's definitely bad, right, which is the way real bad guys operate. And we started cataloging, uh, cataloging uh, post-compromised TTPs. 
and we start building this thing, and you know, we were like, oh man, we're we're awesome. And then we got a pre-release of Miter Attack, and we're said, so that's more awesome. We're gonna adopt that, right? So, um, and and when we looked at Miter Attack, what we saw was what adversaries must do to be successful in their mission, right? Uh, I throw a spearfish and I land on box. I'm in user context. Is that game over, right? Did bad guys win? Uh, no, right? Most likely the data, the information, the goal that I seek is sitting over there on that server somewhere or somewhere else. I'm going to have to move laterally, right? Is there a million infinite ways to move laterally? Absolutely not. These are computers. There's protocols to obey by. There's only so many ways to do it, right? Is there a million different ways to survive a reboot? Absolutely not. There's only a few finite ways that you can do that. So by co concentrating on post-compromised behaviors, uh, which again, aren't inherently malicious, I can move laterally by mapping a network drive, right? Um, now, you know, that's not common for you know, X, you know, user XYZ. It is common for maybe some sysadmins, et cetera, but these are the things that you have to tune and whitelist and define uh, post-compromise logic in a custom manner. So what we did was we said, okay, well, industry is not gonna tell us what, uh, what we're protected against and what we're not, and we don't believe them that they knock, knock down 99% of everything, right? So it's up to us to validate in our own environment and in our customer's environment uh, what we're protected against and what we're not. So we formed a purple team. And uh, I mean, our customer uh, on the DOD side of the fence, they had, uh, you know, nice and handy, they had their red team. Um, and we uh, were, were heading up the, the blue team. Uh, so we informed them that, hey, purple's a thing and we need, to we need to create a red team with these capabilities because what we're gonna do is go through every TTP in MITRE ATT&CK and we're gonna attack, you know, pun intended, the crap out of every CND capability within the environment and understand truly what we're protected against and what we're not. And so we did that and it, it took a while, right? But at the end of the day, we knew where the gaps were and where they were not and shocker, right? There were a lot of gaps. And again, this is an environment that is very locked down, hardened, and um, full defense and depth capability from endpoint to gateway. And still, uh, Red Team was successful uh, because a lot, of that, a lot of that activity and a lot of those TTPs outlined in MITRE were not able to be detected by enterprise products. So again, uh, formed the purple team. And they went through and identified gaps. And it was up to our cyber hunt team to fill those gaps. And essentially, they created custom indicator of compromise logic if data sets were available. Uh, and if data sets were not available, they would go out and find solutions. So Sysmon, OS Query, et cetera, very valuable, um, can be leveraged to detect a lot of these things. Um, once that logic was determined and implemented, uh, it would be validated, right? So when it's good to go, validate it again by the purple team, and then put it into production. And guess what? Uh, when you're developing your own IOCs and developing your own logic, there's going to be some tuning involved, right? You're not you're not depending on a company to do it for you. So uh, you know you need to assume that there's going to be a lot of sustainment pieces of that because environments change. But truly, uh, it it's it it proved to be very fruitful. So again, this is not a one and done. You need a continuous, uh, I guess, assessment capability. We ended up building our own. There's a lot of products out on the market and some of them in this room, like uh, Mr. By uh, Bryson's team uh, that I was just speaking to that does this sort of thing. So um, at the end of the day, does attacking really work? Uh, I would say absolutely yes. Right, so our customer went from unable to detect, being able to detect a lot of any red team activity at all to a year later, not only catching them within the first hour, but then pivoting to that endpoint 
and carving off some binaries, right? That they were able to reverse engineer, and since Red Team was super lazy and reused code, uh, we're able to spread that out into the sensing grid and decimate um, other pockets of infrastructure that they had throughout the customer environment. Um, do I need enterprise defense products? Absolutely, yes. You just need to understand where they fit in your environment and how to leverage them. Again, 95% is what they're good at, not really great at catching the real bad guys. And that's going to, by, by taking that approach, that's going to free your team up, right, with not dealing with that 95% to concentrate on that 5% and really focus and, and find and, and develop logic to find the real bad guys. Um, Understand true, true cyber risk posture. Um, again, when, when you know that, right, easy decision making. So at the, end of the, at the end of the day, our customer knew where the gaps were, right? So when vendor XYZ came in the door and they said, hey, I got the next silver bullet product. Man, you want this in your life? And they say, well, if it can do XYZ, I do because that's where my gaps are, right? And of course, they're going to say, oh, yeah, it, it does that. Uh, well, that's great. Then you take that product, throw it in a lab, and then talk the crap out of it, and then you know, right? Uh, what, or uh, if you have the capability, right? Develop your own custom applications to fulfill it. That's what we ended up doing with uh, for our customer, where we developed a full incident response framework that allowed them to create custom logic and operationalize them and put them in your environment, in their environment. Uh, so at the end of the day, you can you can narrow down and, and free up your IR resources to really concentrate. So you go from defense and depth models where you have full vulnerability full vulnerability management program to system hardening to enterprise defense and depth tool sets um, to where now you're you're really defining and identifying post compromise behaviors and then you know that very last straw to where you have a, a very keen advantage is things that are custom to your environment that an adversary wouldn't know. So to where you can get to that point and really develop initiatives and IOCs that only you would know and only you can trip on in your custom environment, that's, that's where you're winning, right? And once you have the capability to detect post-compromise behaviors, et cetera, um, to where you're able to catalog TTPs leveraged by APT, well, now you have the data uh, that you need, dare I say it, to feed machine learning models, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room have not only access to APT data that was res resident on your network, but also some repositories elsewhere that, that have been collected that you can now leverage those models uh, to help really defend and detect on your network environments. That was a million miles an hour, and I'm sorry, I've just been kind of rocking and rolling, but does, uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Um, so I'll, s I'll tell you what. Initially, when we formed the Purple Team and the initial effort of evaluating every defense product on the network, that was very time-consuming and daunting. Uh, now, mind you, we started this back in 2013, and up until this point, you know, uh, it's it's really benefited. But I'd say the the initial stand-up and the initial baselining is the hardest part because after you got a, a nice baseline of your environment and know where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are, at that point, now you got a tool, and now you got a tool to, to know where to focus, focus your efforts. Yes, sir. So um, luckily, I mean, luckily in the environment that we were dealing with, we weren't really constrained 
Um, but I would say that, you know, uh, judging by a lot of the talks um, that I've heard today, that um, assessing what's specific to you and what's a threat to your environment allows you to focus your efforts. For instance, different APTs are interested in sector XYZ, probably want to start there and focus my efforts there and move and expand outward. Uh, sir? Right, so um, about 200,000 endpoints um, was the, the size. No, no, I'm, I'm saying you definitely do. Absolutely. Um, so that goes back to how big's the biggie, uh, piggy bank, right? Because that's a, that's a whole lot of telemetry, especially if you're dealing with endpoint data, right? So uh, Splunk, it's pretty expensive, right? Elastic, that might be your option. And uh, that, if it's up to you and me, I know you say, let's bring back everything, right? We'll, we'll bring back everything, and then we'll sift through it, and it'll be awesome, right? Um, whereas, uh, depending on your environment, it's going to be, th those decisions are going to be driven by what, you know, what's available to you from a monetary sense, right? As far as data storage and aggregation. And the horsepower that's available to, to churn through it. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I, I think the answer is? Blockchain. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sure, but uh, no, no. I'm honestly, when you're saying that, and I and I joke because blockchain is the answer to everything. But some immutable ledger, right? Where I'm, I'm a red team, or I'm, I'm an assessment firm, or I'm an assessment product that's executing things that could break stuff, or steal stuff, right? Or compromise PII, PHI on a network. How do I validate the integrity of those actions, right? And there, there's recorders and whatnot um, that are I know that are leveraged by a lot of our teams. But at the same time, if I know what I'm doing, they're not, um, they're not immutable, right? So, so in this, in this exercise, no, because what we were simply doing was detecting, and, and a lot of this stuff is very generic, and it's not tied to business processes. Now, that being said, that's the purple, purple effort, and that's detecting these post-compromise behaviors. There are, you know, what you're talking about is measuring impact to critical business processes and whatnot, and that's specifically what we leverage a red team for, to where they have goals and mission sets to perform X, Y, Z, or interrupt X, Y, Z, cause effect X, Y, Z, right? And that's what we leverage those for to measure um, that sort of thing. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when we when we got to thinking about it for the first time, where we were, you know, we said, "Hey, what do we think we're protected against?" And really, at that point, we're, you know, it was back to industry. Well, industry s says I'm I'm protected against X, Y, and Z, so I I think that's what I am. Um, so it really wasn't until we verified what we were and what we weren't um, to, w to where we truly knew our gaps. And are you talking about what drove pro procurement decisions? Absolutely. Um, we were very surprised that we didn't detect much of anything. Right? Um, because again, we're talking about a customer environment that was very hardened, had you know all their patches installed, had all the you know IDS, IPS, full defense in depth capabilities from a you know a CISSP textbook sense, right, right to where you know you're good, um, but <laughs> I'm sorry, um, but at the end of the day. Really, it was a the the surprising thing was the shift in the mindset, right? To where we realized that the way real bad guys operate, nation state human on keyboard, is not what industry is looking for. Industry is looking for known bad. They don't operate in a known bad sense, and that's how they're successful, because you know. They're they're operating in a not bad, not inherently bad, but definitely bad way. Uh, that's taking advantage and living off the land of what's available to them on an OS, etc. So, I would say the the lesson learned and the shock was rearranging uh, our mindsets on what what we were looking for and how to defend against it and how to detect and respond. Let me ask, can I answer um, the earlier question? So one thing that I would uh, point you folks to is the briefing that Spectre Ops gave at AttackCon. So going back to, if we think about this in a very structured, orderly way, attackers go through defined vectors. The question for vectors is, do we have visibility into those vectors? If you have no visibility, good luck trying to find it, right? So Spectre Ops, uh, they went through a systematic uh, analysis of all the things in the attack matrix to, s to narrow down a set of vectors and more so the data you need to be able to see the activity across those vectors. Fabulous work, but it ultimately gets down to uh, at least answering the question whether or not, that you I when, it, when it comes to detection, you're either miss, if you can't detect something, you're either missing visibility or you're missing know-how. So you don't want to miss visibility. Um, and to ensure that you have visibility, that briefing from Spectre Ops is a great one. If you have visibility, then you lack know-how. And that hopefully you can attain or you fire the people and get new people. Any other questions? That's a uh, good part about rocking and rolling, flying through a brief, have some time to chat about it. Um, oh, yes, sir. So it was, um, again, the purple team walking through every defense capability within the environment. Um, once a gap was identified, that uh, assignment was handed off to a cyber hunt analyst who was uh, ba basically tasked with finding a way to detect that behavior or that vector uh, within the environment. Um, and that led to the implementation of Sysmon, uh, OS query, um, various other yeah, I'd say industry capabilities as well for things that we couldn't just develop on our own. Um, so that's how we. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to have you guys think about these frameworks and reuse these frameworks. So wh what you just said was we lacked visibility, and therefore to attain that visibility, we picked up OS query and Sysmon. If you go back to the uh, the briefing I mentioned from Spectre Ops, 
what do they tell you? Hey, if you want to be able to see these um, vec these uh, attacks against these particular vectors, we recommend vector ops recommend you get sysmon and OS query. So it, it helps narrow down again the how we think about the space, frame it, and say, are you actually missing visibility into that vector? If so, then go find these tools that will help you find uh, get that visibility. Okay. A anyway, I, I wanted to connect the dots between all the different conversations we've had so that we continue to have the same conversation on what are the frameworks and models that we need to think about and be able to capture so that we can make this easier going forward. Right, so uh, you had industry, and uh, usually if there's an industry appliance in your architecture, it's there for a reason, right? Whether, uh, hey, I need an IPS, I need, uh, I need a firewall up here, X, Y, Z. So if uh, ultimately, you know, like Sysmon, for instance, we implemented that because we had lack of visibility into a, a certain area, right? Certain vector, sorry. Um, <laughs> We had a lack of visibility into a certain vector, which, um, you know, if so happened then that it overlapped with another capability uh, in the environment, that didn't matter. That was just the cherry on top to where it was dual validated. So we didn't want to, we didn't, we didn't set, set out to seek to remove industry appliances. Uh, we just set out to fill gaps and um, have visibility into vectors. Both, right? It was dual dual approach to where, hey, how do how? Let me, let me differentiate the terminology you just used. Um, Sysmon provides visibility. If your tool didn't have visibility, then doesn't matter. The fine tuning of a tool is usually saying I I need to calibrate um, its filters or its its detection logic. So the know how, right? So usually the fine tuning of the tool is the know how side. But if the tool can't even see it, then that's why you need. Uh, anyway, it, I want to make sure you understand the, the framework and the methodology around how you think about it. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have Christine, who's going to talk about, I, I know it's so late. I can't even remember the titles anymore. Um, do you have a computer? OK. Something about dancing in the cloud. The title? Dancing in the Dark. Asset Management in the Cloud, something like that. Check, check. One, two, one, two. Is it working? Oh. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I was told to thank you all for coming to the more memorable one, but I don't really know what's going on in the on the other side. So, but thank you for coming. I'm Christine. Um, my talk is Dancing in the Dark, Asset Management for Multi-Cloud Environments. So this is all you need to know about me. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm an information security and tools engineer. I love to build things as well as break them. And from the title, you can probably guess that I like Bruce Springsteen and cloud environments. So uh, this is a list of the things we'll be going over today. Uh, we'll briefly cover usage of multiple cloud providers, uh, defining what are assets, why we should uh, track them, some challenges to doing so, and then go over some possible solutions, um, or scenarios and solutions. So living in the cloud, I'm very proud of this slide because I put in this little cloud picture. So we're moving from on-prem and hybrid environments to cloud, like AWS, Azure, GCP, right? We're launching a lot of EC2s, Lambdas, uh, cloud functions, uh, Azure uh, virtual machines. And so we need to be uh, aware of all of these things, not just the traditional assets, but also the uh, configurations uh, that are deployed with the assets. Um, so an asset is a resource whose availability at the right time and place is profitable to your organization. So for your business, it's the applications that are running on the hosts. And for a security um, team, it's those applications, those hosts, as well as their security groups, their uh, ACLs, their identity access configurations. So you, you can't start a fire without a spark. You guys got what I'm saying. My, my friends don't because they're millennials. <laughs> Okay, so, um, right, assets. Um, we need to be aware of uh, what is across our different platforms because we have things that could be in one provider and then in one project and in one VPC, but then we could have something completely different that interacts with that first thing somewhere else in a different account in a different provider. So without having the foundation or consolidation of all of this inventory data, we're going to be scrambling in the dark. We're dancing in the dark, right? Trying to answer the questions of how, like how was this thing deployed? Who deployed it? What is it? Um, and where does it live, right? If an auditor comes to us and goes, where does your product live? And you can't answer that. Or if EC2 sends you an abuse report saying, hey, your host is exhibiting some botnet activity, but that's what your application or your host is supposed to do, um, but you don't know that, uh, then that's a problem. That's a problem um, because it, ref or it shows that your security posture isn't up to par um, when the auditors are checking those boxes, right? If you look confused and they're like, ooh, you don't know what you're talking about, um, it's gonna look or reflect poorly on your brand. So what are some of the challenges that comes with trying to get all of our data into one place? We have multiple cloud um, options. These are just some of them. Uh, they're like, there's GCP, Azure, AWS, but there's also like DigitalOcean, right? We need to be aware of what providers we're using across our environment. So. I mean, we uh, leverage these different uh, platforms because of uh, lock-in prevention or service flexibility cost reasons or through acquisitions and partnerships. Um, a partner, or I'm sorry, a parent organization might use AWS heavily, but a subsidiary might leverage uh, GCP or Azure. So we need to know what uh, providers we're using across our corporate fleets uh, and what resources um, are being deployed across different projects, accounts, zones, or regions. And um, amongst those uh, resources, they could have different lifespans. So when we're trying to collect all of the data 
um, across all of our uh, platforms, we need to have all the data um, in real time, right? We don't want stale data. If we have an incident or a breach and we need to be able to answer the questions of who, what, when, how, or why, um, and the data is from half a month ago, uh, that, that stuff could have been torn down without you knowing, um, and you wouldn't be able to answer all of those questions on demand. Um, and then in addition to those challenges, of just consolidating or being aware of what we have deployed um, and then getting them into one single place um, is that we have different BUs at our organization. Uh, they, they do different things. So they might just launch their resources like their Lambdas uh, or their hosts through Terraform or they use CloudStack and maybe they have a centralized repository of the things that they're deploying, but they're not keeping track of what's ru currently running. So there might be a lack of asset tracking overall, uh, or there could be different forms of tracking. They might use an Excel sheet and manually update it when they have the free time to do so, or they have some bash scripts, like make some API calls, you know, run a cron job, and uh, get their data into a local remote uh, database. Uh, some teams might have uh, fully flushed out applications that will do this. Um, they could have APIs with them. But uh, whatever uh, that your teams are using, you want to communicate with them and be able to uh, pull in this data if they are tracking their resources. And if they're not, you need to be aware of that to account for it. So possible um, scenarios that you guys might have or are using. Right, okay, what <laughs> turn the okay. So if you think about what you're currently doing at your organization, um, you wanna be able to answer these questions. Uh, there's a lot to take in and think about uh, when you're coming up with an approach uh, to uh, tracking your assets. But um, if you can answer yes to the following questions, then you're off to a good start. So first, what you have. Does it effectively give you the data when you need it? So if you're doing an audit or you're doing IR and you need to find a certain host that was launched supposedly at this time and day, right? can you easily go into one dashboard and pull out the data on demand? Or are you going to have to go across all of your different providers into different accounts looking for this one thing. And then is your solution automated? Um, if you're manually updating an Excel sheet, that's going to be slow and you might forget. So it's prone to human error. And then can it scale? If your organization is small and you have a couple of accounts in a single cloud provider, then you could do this job manually, um, but then what happens when your organization grows to multiple cloud providers across a dozen accounts or a hundred accounts and you have thousands of resources? Does your methodology effectively uh, grow as your organization grows? So if you're doing something like uh, polling, um, using APIs and polling for the data across your accounts, uh, that could work, but be aware that rate limiting is a thing, and we'll discuss that in a bit. So if you answered yes to all of those questions, I would love to talk to you after this to see what you're doing. But if you didn't, and uh, you're worrying about your little world falling apart because you don't do asset tracking, and you realize that there's a gap in your security posture, um, then don't worry, because there are some options that I will list for you. So um, there, I'm gonna list like, like three, but you, can, you don't have to use them independently, you can use them together, and I actually recommend it. So if what you have works for you, you could keep it, or you could build upon it. Uh, you could also go the route of uh, utilizing open source projects, and the great thing about them is that they're free, 
And there's room for customization. The downside to customizing them, though, is that it comes in the cost of man hours, and then you have to maintain the uh, application and make sure it doesn't go down. And then there's the third party route where you're paying uh, a vendor for their fully managed uh, tool uh, that comes with reporting and dashboard features. But uh, if you go that route, then it costs money and it, help, it will have to come from your team or department. So if what you have is good, um, then keep it. Uh, just keep in mind that you, know, you want to be able to consolidate all of your data into one place. And so you have a single pane of glass, right? So you want to be able to have um, a clearing house, basically. One place where all of the data is consolidated. Uh, you might want to leverage some scanners or tools that you might already have, like Rapid7 or Nessus. And then you can also tag everything. I actually recommend that you tag your resources uh, accordingly, right? Well, who owns it? What is it for? Uh, what BU is accountable for it? And you could write some customized scripts or APIs for this. And there are also open source options like CloudStack. Uh, that's mainly used for deploying infrastructure, but if you want to be able to launch things and then keep track of what you launch and from one place, that's fine too. Um, what I recommend is Security Monkey, which is beautiful, um, although it doesn't doesn't uh, uh, include Azure, although there are uh, plugins that developers have come up with uh, to make it compatible. So what Security Monkey does is it audits GCP, uh, AWS, and CloudStack. And it uses this uh, polling methodology that will reach into all of your accounts that you add to this tool and to pull for uh, all of the resources that live within those accounts. Uh, providers. So what I mentioned earlier about rate limiting is that this uh, tool does use um, the polling methodology, which is susceptible to rate limiting. So if your infrastructure grows to over like 100 accounts and over like 1,000 resources, then you might hit that issue, and then it will take a while to get your data. So it wouldn't be as fresh as snap of your fingers, but uh, if your Im environment isn't that large, then you're good, and I highly recommend this tool because it'll still work fantastically for you. Um, however, if you are running um, an organization that is bigger than that, uh, keep an eye out for a tool called Historical, put out by Netflix, because that is using, or that will use an event-driven uh, methodology. And I know I'm not supposed to pitch vendors. I don't work for these guys. Uh, but there are uh, third-party tool or yeah, third-party uh, vendors out there uh, that have fully managed uh, products that will manage your cost and usage. I know Cloud Health uh, breaks down resources by account and uh, however else you want to filter on it. So at the end of the day, as security professionals, we're really busy. We have audits, we have security reviews, IR, vulnerability management, and we also have to be able to do this stuff, keep track of what's running across our environments, right? If something opens on port 22 to the world, we want to be able to catch that right away. So if we can come up with an automated process or implement an automated process that will consolidate everything into a single pane of glass and make it scalable, uh, that and we'll see uh, more than just your traditional assets of hosts and databases, but also your serverless applications as well as your security groups and configurations, then that's one less thing to worry about. Credit where credit is due. Thank you. Does anybody have questions? Yes.
so the question is, what has been my experience with mapping the different services and resources across the different cloud providers? And my experience has been painful. Um, because, yes, um, I do focus a lot on the traditional um, assets, of course, the VMs and the, the things like the security groups, yeah. Um, but for those other jobs, it's, it's work <laughs> because AWS, for example, puts out new services all the time and keeping up with it is hard. Um, so I have to say it, it's been a lot of ad hoc scripts that um, myself or my team has put together. So in-house ad hoc scripts. I don't know of any tool that is up to date with all of these new services that will pull in all of this and then give you a comprehensive view of what's going on. Yes, that is one of the problems that we're trying to solve. Let me summarize your question for the audience. Can you summarize your question for the audience? Oh, okay. Yes, okay. So the question is, are the tools that um, I have implemented or used uh, attack vectors, or can they be attack vectors, and have I done threat modeling for them? Uh, yes they can be if not configured correctly. Uh, so that's one of the things that I love to talk about and after this talk, we'll, we can talk about policies and restricting permissions and least privilege. Um, but the, the tools that um, I configure and put up, they have read only. So yeah, they do reach into all of these other accounts. Um, but um, as far as Security Monkey, for example, they don't go to an object level, uh, so they're not looking at uh, PII or customer data. They're looking at the buckets themselves that these uh, pieces of data could live in. So yeah, they read access, but to an extent, and there isn't right access. Uh, like, well, there's right access to the database that it's uh, putting the data in. Is that a hand? IT. Oh. Okay, so it happens a lot um, by our own uh, employees and colleagues. People launch things in lab and sometimes production uh, without telling us. So these the um, the overall goal, um, in addition to others is to be able to keep a wide view of everything across these cloud uh, platforms like at, at ready. So if we can see that there is an instance uh, being launched with permissions that are way too permissive, uh, we will get an alert for them. So one of the tools, Security Monkey, also has alerting built in, um, and there's also Jira ticket automation. So you can uh, configure the uh, rules that, so if they match, then it will gen automatically generate a ticket and alert you for it. Does that answer your question? Sure.
I'm not sure why uh, management's um, allowing that or expensing it. Okay, well, I, ch I chase after those people. Because <laughs> So that really depends on your resources, man hours, how big your team is. And it really depends on what your infrastructure and your organization does. Uh, because at the end of the day, there are only so many of us and we have to sleep at some point. I really wish there was a limit, but with all of the services that can be used, there are so many things that could go wrong. And I can't say there is a limit. For example, if you have a Lambda function, the permissions that it could have or the roles that it can assume, those are important and those need to be looked at. And then also the code that's being executed, for example. Um, and for queues, if you're talking about like S2S or messaging queues, I mean, they you, you need to look at where they're writing to and also what they're writing, right? It, I mean, it's, it's entirely possible that there's PII in there. I know that's not the best answer, but that's the world we live in. Any more questions? So let me give my second talk. So we have about 10 minutes, and we're all going to go back into the next room for last 15-minute kind of summary. And then we are going to probably head over to the party or reception or whatever you want to call it. So we would like to talk about tomorrow. It's very, very important for the philosophy track that we talk about tomorrow and what's going to happen. So I'll just hand it over to Sunil. Yeah, I know. I'm not talking publicly anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so a couple things. Um, we do have a few more talks lined up tomorrow, but really the, the point of tomorrow and Friday is to uh, deep dive into um, these working documents, these frameworks. And so what I would like to have you guys do is to think through all the talks that we've gone through today and essentially, um, well one, the, the speakers essentially uh, what I would ask the speakers to do is to, uh, if you feel like there is something that you want the group to wrap their heads around, then propose that, okay? Propose it as a, I would like for us to work on this framework, right? Okay? And then we'll vote, or actually I don't know if we need to vote as much as we just need to get people to say, okay, yes, I would like to participate with you on that framework. And we'll have a deeper dive discussion on each of those frameworks, have the group as a whole, uh, the, the speaker, as well as a co-partner in building out that framework, um, basically facilitate a discussion around it. And we, we try to capture as much as possible information about how do we move that so th that concept further, okay? So that's the goal for tomorrow and for Friday, to be able to capture that in some sort of document that we can then take back home, uh, share that with our te teams, and actually put it to practice. So again, speakers, please think about whether or not you would want to take your topic and uh, make it turn it into some sort of framework document. And if you do, then that's where really the whole purpose of this, uh, this track is, is intended to do. Any questions on that? Okay. And if you want to get, get an example of what I mean, uh, go to the Art and Science website towards the bottom somewhere on the left side. <laughs> You'll see some of the framework documents that we had previously. So it, it, it's bit.ly 
slash uh, ACOD dash something, like near misses or um, product testing or hazard framework or whatever else it might be. Okay, so you'll get a sense of what we did in the past and what we want to try to do going forward tomorrow. Okay? All right. Okay, so um, <laughs> Turbo Talks. Um, so actually, I, I, I had a Turbo Talk on uh, the uh, fantasy cyber leagues, okay? And the thought was, a anyone ever play, uh, uh, oh, I'm losing the strat, not strat, uh, uh, s uh, no, saber metrics, saber metrics. A anyone ever do like uh, baseball cards? Wow, is that like, Yeah, I know. I was gonna say, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm. I, f I feel old. Sabermetrics. Yes. Not cybermetrics. Sabermetrics. Okay. So anyway, the whole point of that is, uh, you have you have essentially a bunch of. Um, Okay, this is totally half-baked, okay? But that's kind of the idea behind some of these things. All right, so the basic uh, question, the hypothesis is, can we, take, can we use measurement techniques that we find in the fantasy fill-in-the-blank leagues uh, to make predictions about threat actors and whether they're successful or they're gonna fail, okay? That's the question. Can we, are there, is there something to be learned? So who, who plays fantasy, football, baseball, hockey, whatever? Okay, all right, whatever, okay, good. Nah, not really. Okay, fine. Yes. So. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the key, uh, right. So what? 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 Okay. What Steve just said is what makes it different for us for for to be able to play these fantasy football leagues and such is that you have all this detail on the the actors. Okay which we lack. So the, the point of the discussion then is how, uh, if we were to try to find a way to, uh, so one of the things that we, we know, once we know what we lack, we can then start working towards saying, let's get that information, okay? Or at least a proxy for that information. That's kind of the whole point, okay? So who are the teams, okay? But it's not just about teams. It's the players, right? Who are the players? Okay. All right. Now, and ultimately, um, I mean, I would love to be, ab be able to distill a specific player within, let's say, one of these organizations, but it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to do. So at, at some level, we would say, at, at the aggregate level, this is a player, right? So APT 10 is a player, okay? And ultimately, what we're trying to do now is to apply the sabermetrics approach and say, what can I find out about that player, all right? And if I look at sabermetrics in general or just look at um, the science of baseball sabermetrics, uh, there's this, I, I, I didn't even realize <laughs> how many data points there are. I just thought it was like how many you know, runs they have, right? Uh, but no, th like I, I'll just like, uh, I'll give you a really like plate appearances sacrifice hits, uh, intentional bases on balls. Okay, all the hits, hit by pitch. Okay, I don't know. there's all these different things that characterize um, these stats that go into the success or failure rates for a given person. Yeah, yeah, okay, so actually that's a great point. 
because ultimately you, you have an ontology based on whatever is observable, right? Okay, so the question now is, there, there are a couple, there's two things that we can do. One is, there's a set of observables, and for those obser observables, let's put them in some category. Okay, let's categorize that. But as you know from all the discussions that we've had today, I love complete frameworks. I want something that's complete. What is completeness in this regard? A and Mark, I, I don't know what if the work that you've done helps establish completeness, but in some respect, I'm trying to establish completeness to say, uh, I know what I have, and I know what I'm missing. And then how do we work towards getting what we miss, okay? And of the observables that we have, what where does that live, okay? All right. Now. I um, like I said, this is half-baked, so let me kind of uh, walk through a couple couple things. So in a baseball scorecard, you know, you got to play the uh, Yankees. Oops. Yeah. Done? 